We responded to a smash and grab jewelry heist and it ended up in the fastest high speed pursuit I've ever been in. We were traveling in excess speeds of 110 miles an hour. And I remember in the back of my mind thinking, one wrong move and my partner and I are dead because we're not gonna survive a crash at 110 miles an hour. It's a daunting testing process from the moment you decide you want to be a police officer to filling out the application and going through the background process. That can take anywhere between four to six months because what they do is they open up your entire life to be an open book. They will go back and they will find people you haven't talked to in 10, 15 years trying to find out if you are the person that is in front of them on paper. My police academy was 26 weeks long. It was five days a week, eight to 10 hours a day. Once you have graduated from the police academy and you go back to your police department, you have 21 weeks with a field training officer. I have to ride along with my field training officer who's going to teach me how to take that academy knowledge and apply it in real life scenarios. Though some people get through the academy, they don't get through field training. It is going from one tough program to the next. I've had the opportunity to work with the FBI, DEA, and ATF. Now, as a matter of fact, my department is a mid-sized department, and we actually have detectives that have been loaned out to the FBI, have been loaned out to the DEA and Customs. And because of those cases that they build, we end up coming in on the SWAT team and serving those search warrants and those arrest warrants for those particular assignments that these officers are in, as well as when I was a detective, yes, I got to work with different states as well as different countries, especially regarding missing persons or loss of money. You know, we have those various different types of investigations. So yes, I've actually had a very fortunate experience and to be able to work with not just federal agencies, but agencies outside of the United States. Everybody misses the Crown Vic. Crown Vic was one of the best police cars ever made. It was fast, it was low to the ground. Just that traditional police car, but are we getting used to the Ford Explorer? Yes, we're not like bending down to get inside the vehicle. It's actually a little bit easier for us to get inside, especially with all this gear that we wear. I think now we are so used to the Ford Explorer that we would be like, why are we getting rid of the Ford Explorer? If you look at the history of police cars, we get new police cars like every 10 years. So this is just another evolution of policing. First of all, be a good person of good character. That's the first thing. But number two, you got to be able to run three miles a day minimum. You got to be able to do 50 push ups. You should be able to do 10 pull ups and you should be able to do 50 sit ups. Those are the baseline physical requirements for just about every police academy. I tell people you should be able to run one mile in eight to nine minutes. So that should give you a gauge of how fast you should be. Eventually, though, while you're in the academy, you'll be running six, seven, eight miles once the academy starts progressing and the months go by because they're building you up. You know, I'm sure there's some amount of it that goes on in places, but the reason why you gotta be against it as a police officer is because we have a system in place where the facts are presented to a jury and they decide guilt. We can't go around deciding if someone's guilty or someone's innocent. That's up for a jury of your peers to decide. So a vigilante could get it wrong and that means someone innocent could get hurt and that's what we don't want. So I'm not a big fan of the vigilante. It's great for uh, comic books, but in real life, not so much. I I have never seen a physical fight in my 23 years. I'm sure it's happened. I'm sure one officer has pissed off another officer and they got into a fist fight, but I've never heard of it. But if it did happen, both are gonna get wrapped up in an investigation and both have to face internal affairs and face whatever discipline the chief of police wants to give them. I think Hollywood sucks when it comes to what I do for a living. I would actually kind of like love to be a cop in Hollywood because it seems like they get to do all this stuff and then there's no paperwork and there's no ramifications for breaking policy and stuff like that. So Hollywood has definitely got it wrong. There's only a couple of shows that were kind of close but still a little bit of Hollywood-ish and I just don't know why that's entertainment because it's definitely not realistic. It's like people think that we can solve a crime in 45 minutes with commercials. We definitely can't do that. As a game player, myself. I'm not too hard on video games because the devs are programming and they're trying to come up with an entertainment value for the player. So I can give them a little bit more leeway in regards to the characters not being realistic. But in Hollywood, I'm kind of a little bit more crucial on them because they have an opportunity to teach the public on what policing is all about instead of these like all we just do is run and gun type of stuff. So I, I really wish that Hollywood would come up with some type of show that portrayed us in not in a good light, but in reality sense. We responded to a smash and grab jewelry heist 
and it ended up in the fastest high speed pursuit I've ever been in. We were traveling in excess speeds of 110 miles an hour. And I remember in the back of my mind thinking, I, cause I was driving one wrong move and my partner and I are dead because we're not gonna survive a crash at 110 miles an hour. It ended at an indoor mall. The mall had to be shut down. Suspects everywhere, we're doing a manhunt. We eventually get everybody into custody. Unfortunately, the bad guys were throwing jewelry and stuff out of the windows on the freeway. So we had to shut down the 10 freeway and we had to actually physically, every officer that we could spare walk side by side, picking up the evidence for a good two miles. California Highway Patrol wasn't too happy about having one of their freeways shut down, but that probably was one of those ones where I just went, wow, that was flipping awesome. You know, just like jewelry robbery, car chase, suspects running all over the place, calling in all these police departments from all over the area to help us do an area search and then finally getting everybody in custody. I think that's uh, up there on my list. The Miranda rights thing is another Hollywood blooper. We do not have to read people their Miranda rights when we put handcuffs on them. Every time I watch a cop show, as soon as the cuff is going on, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say you can will be used against your court of law. No, we don't have to do that. We only have to read you your Miranda warning when we are going to question you about the crime. If I'm not gonna question you because a detective's going to question you, then I can just put the handcuffs on you, put you in back of the police car, transfer you to the jail, process you, put you in your cell, and in the morning when the detective comes over to interview you, he or she has to read you the Miranda warning. So reading the, of Miranda right at the time of arrest is not a requirement of the law. That's a Hollywood thing. So here's one of the most common things that I see wrong with TV and movies is the amount of times we use our gun. That is far-fetched. It is not even close to that. The second worst is the reading of Miranda. We do not read Miranda in those situations. So those two things are like, please get it right. Assaults aren't common like people think. Sometimes people will say, or ask, why do officers use foul language? Well, believe it or not, that's kind of the first level of force. Because if I can yell at you and maybe throw a curse word in there, you might listen to the orders of the officer. So that's kind of the first level. At that point in time, force is really dictated by the actions of the suspect. If the suspect decides to arm themselves, like with a knife or cane or something like that, then the officer is gonna to have to raise that level of force that he's gonna to need to use against that subject. Throughout the day, we could go days without ever using force on a subject. And then sometimes there could be days where two or three people just decided that they wanted to fight the police. I don't think it's as common as people think it is because if it was as common as people think it is, I think our news channels would just be inundated with stories of police officers using force. I think it's just one of those things where people believe it's happening, but I can tell you right now, I approve all the reports on my shift and I don't see a lot of use of force coming across my desk. Me personally, I don't believe there's any correlation between playing violent video games and anybody doing violent acts. I think it just takes a evil person that wants to visit violence onto somebody else. If they just happen to play video games, it's just a coincidence. Playing video games and the very fact that I've been playing video games since I was 13 and now a police officer and probably one of the most non-violent people in the world. I don't think about violence. I just take it as pure entertainment. That's what it is. So I don't believe there's a correlation. I know people do studies from time to time, but there's definitely no correlation. It's how you were raised as a person and how much you value other people's lives that make you either a good or a bad person. When we talk about force on force, a suspect's force dictates the force we are going to use. So if we are fighting with a suspect and all of a sudden they produce a handgun, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna get shot, but it does raise the stakes depending on what they do. It could end up being um, an officer decide to use their firearm to neutralize the threat. That's why we use the word neutralize because we don't know what tool is gonna to be necessary to neutralize the threat. That's what we're doing is we're neutralizing the threat, we're trying to effect an arrest so we could take them into custody. Drunk persons come in one of two ways. They come nice or they come mean. I love happy drunks because sometimes you can just call somebody to come pick them up and we just wait there until the family member gets there. Sometimes you can even get them an Uber. It's the ones that wanna fight us that I don't like because if anyone who knows alcohol, alcohol numbs your body and so it doesn't feel pain. If they decide to fight, that means some of the small pain compliance like maybe a rear wrist lock, putting a couple of fingers together to cause a little bit of pain won't work on them and we have to apply more pain to try to effect an arrest for being intoxicated in public. It all just depends on what kind of intoxicated drunk person they are because even when you're intoxicated and you try to talk to them, it doesn't make any sense in their mind. So talking with them just doesn't work sometimes because that is obviously the first level of de-escalation. So we kind of just like hope that they go along with the program. So yes, but you're dealing with two different types of drunk, happy or mean. Maybe you should switch to water, my friend. I have been helping people since I was 13 years old as a police explorer. 
I then volunteered as a paramedic explorer, became an EMT paramedic, and now I'm a police officer. My whole entire life has been working around helping people, and that's why I will continue to do until they tell me I can't do it anymore.